Wee. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Friday with Wendler. I hope everyone's doing well. As you can see, we have a Christmas tree up uh, over my shoulder. And uh, so that means uh, it's time to spend some money, right? All right. We don't have... We don't have any questions here, so I don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, so, and I'm not just going to sit here and talk and pontificate. So, uh, if anyone has any questions, please do so. I know there's a comment there, but it's just like a phrase. Uh, so, if anyone has any questions, please do, please do so in the chat. Uh, if not, then we can go ahead and get uh, started training. Uh, anyway... The other thing is I just got my new Popo Medic sweatshirt in. If anyone's uh, familiar with Popo Medic, uh, it is a uh, YouTube channel that is incredibly fun. Uh, he uh, does some great storytelling about some uh, pretty uh, uh, miraculous things that happen. For example, he just did the uh, Lone Survivor story, the Operation Red, Red Wings. And uh, he's done like the North Hollywood shootout that some of you are probably familiar with. If you've seen the movie Heat, uh, the movie Heat used the North Hollywood shootout as inspiration, as well as a million other things like the uh, Red Cell um, uh, from the, was it Rich, Richard Markenko, what, Markenko, something like that. Anyway, incredibly entertaining, very well done. Um, and uh but uh, very fun so uh, my son and i both enjoy him it's a good way to sit down and uh see a awesomely well produced and the music is phenomenal uh it reminds me of the old days so to speak <coughs> uh is everyone so here's a couple questions here uh is everyone doing better from the respiratory illness everyone but me uh so it's just kind of dragging on all right eric Bo Chant, I don't know, whatever, Eric. He says, hey, do you have any direct network for your players? My son plays center and nose tackle and want to keep him healthy. Yes, we do both neck flexion and neck extension. The flexion is done while lying on the bench, uh, flat bench. Hang your head all the way off it. You put a plate, usually a 25 or a 45 pound plate on your forehead and you just arch back and come up basically just a big range of motion doesn't have to be super super heavy um and then we do neck extension and that's done with uh manual resistance so um if you have a neck harness you can do neck extension like that too we don't get super crazy uh with a million different neck exercises but the when you add those into our regular training, which involves a lot of upper back and trap work, uh, we have seen a massive decrease in concussions, uh, as well as eliminating fatigue uh, has been a big thing. Uh, I think people seem to discount that as part of the concussion protocol, uh, con you know, preventing concussions is managing fatigue. And that just doesn't mean just during the games, that means obviously during practice during training and all that other stuff. So um, I would, uh, you know, there's not just one thing or one cause of uh, preventing concussions or at least not preventing them, uh, minimizing them. Uh, obviously creatine would be, uh, has shown uh, some pretty remarkable effects as far as coming back from a concussion and brain health. And, uh, but anyway, I would, uh, I would just, be consistent with the neck work. It doesn't have to be done super heavy. It just has to be done. Uh, so uh, just has to be done for uh, uh, you know fairly moderate weight, I guess. You know, I've tried maxing out on the neck harness. That was a horrible idea. Not necessarily maxing out, but going very heavy. And for me, that was not a good idea. All right, and next question or so. Uh, so, what are your general thoughts on training for raw powerlifting? as the only long-term goal. What would you do based on what you have learned, experienced, and observed, especially for the past 10 years? If I was only raw powerlifting, 
as the only long-term goal? Uh, well, I'd still have some balance in my program. I mean, I still think you need to be doing some flexibility, mobility work, and your conditioning would probably be very, very easy, but very consistent, you know, weight vest, walking, riding in aerodyne, stuff like that, but nothing that's too crazy. I mean, you can throw in some prowler and stuff every once in a while. Um, but I think the other big thing would be to, uh, have some downtime when you're training and that could be, you know, that's depends on how, how, uh, experienced and strong you are. But I think <clears throat> one of the mistakes that I made, and it's really not a horrible mistake, but I was always pushing and pushing and pushing. And I think there's a little bit of time where you can kind of back off a little bit and just enjoy, uh, your body, get some rest. It doesn't mean you stop training. It just means you, uh, back off the total volume and back off the intensity. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't hit some singles and stuff. It just means the overall uh, volume at 90% and above would be a, probably a little bit less. And, uh, you know, and then during that so on so-called off season where you're kind of taking it easy, you add in some different exercises that you normally probably wouldn't do uh, just to keep your body uh, from, you know, getting your uh, yeah just repetitive wear and just something that keeps your mind uh, crisp so but yeah I mean if that was my only goal I think that's pretty easy I mean all you gotta do is get stronger on three things so um, the other thing too I you know severely uh, watch my diet as far as uh, making sure I was getting enough whole food protein and uh, just monitoring that um, and just really looking as you know, for long-term goal, then you got to stack wins every day. I think when people have a long-term goal, they do two big mistakes is one, they say they have a long-term goal, but they treat it like a short-term goal or they half-ass for a while because like, ah, oh, screw it. I got 10 years. I can, I can take some time off. So, uh, but that's kind of, that's more my, uh, that's probably my more my personality trait is just stacking good wins. Um, uh, another question I heard you mention in a podcast, you do a crazy amount of reps for dumbbell rolls, rows. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. Do you progress the weight after hitting certain reps? How would you suggest I program this? I don't program my dumbbell rows. I don't really program the assistance other than, I just choose an exercise and I choose kind of what I want to do and then go from it. So basically all we did back in the day was, uh, you know, after we bench pressed or whatever the hell we did, our main movement, you know, after, and then we might do a supplemental movement. We would just choose like dumbbell rows. And then this is exactly how it would go. I would ask the guys, what do you want to do? And they would say, uh, uh let's try the 115 or the 150 or 180 or, the 100 and then we would just do a couple warm-up sets and then go all out and see how many reps we can get that was pretty much it uh so we would just be as creative as possible and there's a million different things i wrote on the forum about this there's a lot of different ways but i never like wrote anything out it's assistance work man you're supposed to be creative you're supposed to have fun and, and i really think that's one of the lost arts that you know i am a probably a huge problem with uh, that I, or that I caused was, uh, you got to learn how to train on your own a little bit and you have to learn how to train for the day and, uh, be creative. Uh, one of the good things about the five through one program and other programs is it kind of tells you exactly what to do, but you've got to be ready to make some changes. You have to be ready to be creative. You have to be ready to do something off the cuff. And that's the one thing I think is missing by far, uh, from most people. Uh, because I mean, back in the day, we didn't really have training programs like we have today where they just tell you what to do. You had to learn. And I think that's one of the things people need to do. So I never progress the weight. You just do stuff and then kick ass at it and record it in your training log and then come back occasionally and try to best that weight or reps or do something else. So Tom Bryant says hill sprints best to do on lower body days. Uh, it depends on what you're doing on those lower body days. If it's too intensive, it's probably not. If it's uh, <clears throat> fairly low volume uh, and fairly high intensity, 
you could probably get away with it. The most important thing, Tom, you ready this for hill sprints is that you do them. So whatever kind of fits your schedule best, um, you know, in a perfect world, you know, you'd lift three days a week and do hill sprints or something else on the other days. And that's what we did for years and years and years. You know, the problem with that, especially as you get older, is your recovery kind of goes down the dumper because you're essentially doing a ton of hard things day after day after day after day. And uh, <clears throat> um, so uh, that would be more of a personal thing. And what a, <clears throat> um, whatever kind of suits your schedule. So, you know, if, if for example, you, you only have time to train Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday is just racked with shit, you know, and you're just always busy, then it's best to do them on your training day because the most important thing is that you do them. A lot of that stuff, guys, with programming and stuff, there's no real perfect answer. The most perfect answer is what fits your schedule. And uh, then you, with your mentality, and your readiness and preparedness uh, have to adjust to whatever is your reality. And I think people need to stop looking for the, for the optimal all the time and look for what is optimal for you at that time. And then whatever it is, you adjust your mindset <clears throat> based on whatever your reality is. And I guarantee you it will work because I've seen some really stupid training plans. I've done some horrible training plans. And that's just what I had to do. Um, based on my schedule, and then they magically seem to work. So, <clears throat> uh, Jeremy says, do you work with the basketball team at London or any other team? I only work with the kids who play football and then play other sports. So I don't work directly with the basketball team or the wrestling team or track team or anything like that. Does the training change? No, because all of our training is 100% GPP. So, I suppose like any smaller high school, you have some players <coughs> <coughs> playing multiple sports. Yep. And we just train right through those sports, just like we train right through the uh, football season. So that's just the way it goes. Uh, but yeah, I do not work with the basketball team or the wrestling team. Um, mostly because the support, I am 100% committed to our football program. I am. I have 100% support from uh, our football coach. You will not get that many areas. I'm sure some of you guys who are coaches understand what I'm saying. I'm saying 100% support. Our football program is, uh, our training is just as important as anything else. And I literally mean that. I mean, we work around whatever schedule we have for training uh, and for practice. The training is always uh, one of the, if not the top priority, because we believe so much in it. So, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, like I, I've said this a million times, every young athlete needs the same basic needs physically. Uh, you don't need to be doing SPP when a kid who is uh, 14 or 15 years old, he can't even uh, do 10 pull-ups or jump on a box uh, without looking like a, like an absolute uh, <clears throat> idiot. So, um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, the training doesn't change. We still do the main lifts. We still do uh, assistance lifts. And obviously if the kids are in season, we back off just like when we back off during the football season, um, as far as total volume and our, all of our assistance work and all the other little odds and ends that we throw in there. Like, obviously if the kid is playing basketball, we're not doing any extra jumping. I mean, that's stupid, right? I mean, can you imagine doing an in-season program for uh, basketball and having them do more jumping? Uh, in the weight room, they just don't need to do it. So you just fill in the gaps and fill in the holes. And for the most part, that is the main lifts and some uh, high priority assistance lifts. And then you get the hell out of the weight room. So, um, all right. RNC says, why are pull-ups so hard to progress? I feel like I get one extra rep every two weeks if I'm lucky. Well, that's pretty good. That's amazing. Do I need to do more pull-ups? I can do a straight set of seven to eight reps right now. Well, imagine if you had to do bench press and you had 225, and that was the only way you could bench press. It's going to get hard, and it's going to be hard to increase your reps. Um, so, And that's essentially what you're doing for a lot, especially for a lot of people who aren't terribly strong with doing a pull-up or maybe weigh a little extra uh, and have some uh, – <clears throat> some lovable pounds on their body, so to speak. So 
Uh, yeah. So if you're getting one extra rep every two weeks, that's pretty amazing. Um, I, I don't know what you're expecting, but I think that's really good. Um, do, he asked, do I need to do more pull-ups? Listen, you could do his pull-ups as often as your body allows you to do the pull-ups. A lot of times people complain about elbow and forearm pain. What I've noticed, uh, uh, if you do a neutral grip, wide, medium, whatever, seems to take a lot of the pressure off the elbows and forearms. So I think that might be uh, something you can add in. And the other thing is make sure you're changing your grip. You know, we do a million grips. We have the, you know, obviously the overhand, wide, medium, close. Uh, underhand, we do close and medium. We have a variety of uh, neutral grips. We do over under like this. We do, you know, side to side. Uh, we go from ropes or towels. So make sure you're varying your grips. It's not just one grip. Um, RNC goes on, says, would you also recommend dumbbell rows over inverted rows? No, I think you should do both. You know, use a wide variety of pulling movements, guys. You don't just have to do one or two. And he said, also, where does the name Fat Man Row come from? Uh, I don't know. That's what we used to call it because it was kind of like a, a, a chin-up, so to speak, done for guys who couldn't do a chin-up, and that's usually guys who are a little overweight. So we just called it the Fat Man Row. So, uh, Okay, Joe King says, what advice would you give people – intimidated to post or share their writing online well uh i get it i was at that point sometime so one of the things that i think was a huge turning point in my life was when i was at the university of kentucky and i was uh working with the baseball team and i was applying for different jobs and stuff like that and i was really <clears throat> nervous and i felt like i was going to screw everything up and then I had this realization, you know, I had been training since I've been 13 or so years old. I have been consuming knowledge, uh, you know, much more than I probably should have. It's probably been concentrating on other stuff, too. And I realized that, yes, there's probably 100 people that could do a way better job than me. But there's 10,000 people that would do a much worse job than me. So, Joe... Even if your uh, writing isn't the greatest, it's probably going to be better as long as you, you know, obviously aren't an absolute idiot than what a lot of people are writing. So, and, you know, the other thing is uh, when you're writing online, it's, it's, you don't really have to see the reaction of the audience. I mean, uh, uh, it's, <clears throat> if you really want to be intimidated, go speak in front of a seminar in front of, you know, 500 people or 100 people or 20 people. That's very intimidating. So, um, and plus you get to revise stuff uh, when you write online. So, um, man, at some point, Joe, you're going to have to start believing in what you are and who you are and believe in what you share. And so uh, maybe that's part of the deal. Maybe you don't really uh, fully have the confidence in what you're saying. Uh, when you do, just go for it. And uh, you know what? You're going to get shredded you're gonna get yelled at you're gonna get made fun of and that's part of being online i mean tom brady still gets shit on all the time and it's crazy i mean when you, tom brady gets crapped on you realize that uh you know you're probably not the tom brady of, of training so you're it's gonna come for you so uh but you <clears throat> the big thing is you're gonna have to do it at some point and just make sure uh Maybe the reason why you're intimidated is because you don't fully have confidence uh, in what you believe. So maybe that might be part of it. Maybe you have to work a little harder and get that confidence uh, so that you really know what you're, you feel like you know what you're talking about. Josh Osborne says, good morning, Jim. Uh, oh, no, no, hold on. Heavyweight says, uh, about the dumbbell rows, I thought I read you did between 20 and 50 reps a set for grip work. I think you're talking about dumbbell rows. Yeah, sometimes we would do that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's – I guess that's a lot of reps. I don't know. That's just what we did, man. You just do some crazy shit, and I don't know if that's crazy or not. I don't think it is. Um, so, yeah, we would do some pretty dumb stuff. That was just – you know, a lot of us – 
when we were training, it, when you start training with a super competitive group, you're not just going to put the dumbbells down uh, or, you know, stop doing curls or push downs after 10 reps. You're going to have some jerk talking trash to you. And all of a sudden your supposed 10 rep set turns into a 78, 79 rep set. And then you can't move for a little bit and it just becomes a big trash talking fest. So that's one of the best things about training with a good friend and someone you can trust and someone you can have some fun with and someone who pushes you is you start doing some crazy stuff. So, um, and then you become super competitive, just like when you play sports, uh, when you play with people who are a little better and maybe not just a little better, but more competitive than you, you start to push a little bit harder. So uh, I would highly recommend that if you don't have that, you're going to have to find that animal inside you that really starts going a little bananas on some of this stuff. <clears throat> All right, back to Josh Osborne. He says, good morning, Jim. I just wanted to say thank you for doing these Q&As. They mean so much to so many. Well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. I like doing this. Uh, Zach Kashow says, what do you do for recovery? Have you hopped on the cold plunge train? We did cold plunge and cold baths in college. So it's really not very new. I mean, I know people are all into it. The most important thing I do for recovery is I sleep and I try to eat fairly well and I do some mobility and stuff like that. So I don't really do anything crazy for recovery, uh, but I've noticed if I sleep fairly well and I eat okay and uh, I train fairly standard, so to speak. So I'm not going out and, you know, putting on a 400 pound weight vest and walking for 80 miles. Uh, as long as my training's fairly, fairly, you know, common sensey, I'll be fine. Uh, I don't have, uh, I'm at that point where like, if I'm tired and all that other stuff, that doesn't bother me. Like I can kind of grind through a lot of that stuff. And I welcome it. You know, the more the thing that I have a big deal with is, is, you know, as I've gotten older, it's not that stuff that I have to recover from. It's, you know, I have to be, be okay with my injuries. And so that becomes the uh, limiting factor. So um, Daniel Brophy says, hey, Jim, do you have standards for older lifters or yourself to aim for? Examples are, you know, how many push-ups and pull-ups. It's hard with older lifters, lifters, Daniel, because a lot of them have been training for a million years. A lot of them have only been training for one or two. A lot of them have a massive amount of injuries. A lot of them don't. So you, it's hard to say. Um, and I think what each lifter needs to do, older lifter needs to do, is figure out the things that you can do. For example, some guys can still run and kick ass at running. So I think it's important that those guys, you know, if they still enjoy running, Go out and try and kick ass on a certain thing, a certain run. Um, if you can't run, then you have to figure out another exercise or movement or whatever you uh, activity that you can kick ass with and then set those own standards. And, you know, you can always look uh, to other things. For example, I love doing weight vest walks. So I started using the uh, RB Ranger 12 mile ruck test as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, standard. And obviously I'm not going to be an army ranger anytime soon. I'm not using, I think they use a 55 pound pack and I think you have to finish in less than three hours. My big thing was I'm just going to put on a 20 pound vest. And as long as I can finish 12 miles, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and if a guy, for example, if an older lifter can only do one pull up, getting him to do five pull-ups is a massive deal and he should feel good about that. So if I set the standard at 10, it's going to make that dude feel a little shitty. And I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think we're all trying to get better within our little pocket of limitations and about who we are. Um, so I think that stuff, uh, while it's awesome, um, that each in each person has those things, I think it's hard for an uh, individual, uh, <clears throat> like myself to make like a big standard broad scope standards. Uh, and I think it's a little unfair. And uh, now we have standards obviously for a high school football team. And uh, I think that's a little easier to do because we're all, they're all the same age. They're all playing the same sport. They're all 
supposed to be X, Y, and Z. And, uh, but even then, if I have a kid who can barely, you know, trap bar deadlift 155, and we have these kids, if he ever gets to 225, and even if he's well short of his, of our standard, that should be applauded because he worked, and I know this, this kid can do it. Uh, he's going to, he had worked so hard to get there. And I think that needs to be recognized. So, um, uh, okay. Cody says, Hey Jim, I hope you and the family are feeling better. Everyone else seems to be except for me. Sons of bitches. <coughs> he says, I know you're not big on new music and bands, but curious if you checked out worm and black braid. Among my favorite releases this year, uh, I have not. I will check them out. I, I think I've heard of Black Braid. I don't know who Worm is, though. Uh, Dimitri says, hey, how do you add core work to your walrus training? Uh, thanks, and I love the knee sleeves. Man, I still I love our knee sleeves. I think they're the best on the market, obviously, or I wouldn't sell them. So there's a couple ways to add some core work, and I assume you just mean like abs and low back. One would be to uh, use it as a bookend of either the, at the beginning or at the end where it's just really not part of the, um, the actual circuit stuff that you do. That's one way of doing it. So you might start your training program with, you know, two sets of uh, hanging leg raises and maybe a set or two of ab work of um, ab wheel and then going out about your training or every third or fourth set instead of doing your lower body work. So let's say you're just doing squats instead of doing uh, the squats on that particular uh, round of the circuit, you would do ab wheel. So you would just replace, and it doesn't have to be every one or every other one. It could be every five, every three uh, stuff like that. And uh, as long as it's fairly intensive, I've done that quite a bit and it seems to work. Um, so, and then obviously you can do it after you're done. Uh, I really like to do it before because after you're done, sometimes you, you know, you have all these grand plans. I'm going to do this and this and this after, and then you get done with your training and you feel like absolute hell and you don't do it. Uh, so space battleship, Alex says, Hey Jim, I must admit hearing you talk about having fun with assistance lifts made me realize how rigid my programming has, has become. I enjoy lifting, but sometimes I overthink things, and I bet most here do. Can you offer more advice on this or how to avoid overcomplicating things, especially for an older, busy lifter or a young athlete? Uh, well, the advice, man, is uh, and I learned this very early on. We always get the main lifts done. I would learn this at a very young age. Uh, when I was about a sophomore in high school, they always said, like, listen, the squat, bench, clean, deadlift, all that stuff is the most important. And then after that, we would just get together as a group and map something out. And we would just have, you know, as long as you're uh, doing something, pushing for your upper body or something, some kind of pulling, whether it be curls or rows, man, we would just have fun. And sometimes it was absolutely stupid. Uh, sometimes it was really not much at all. And, uh, What's amazing is if you're really feeling good and magically you're going to do more and have some fun. If, if you're not feeling very good, you might do a couple sets here and there. And that's what that's kind of your body's way of telling you, like maybe you're not ready for that right now. And uh, so I, you know, the most important thing is when I train, I guess this is the answer to your question. When I'm in that weight room in my garage, that's my time. I want to enjoy it. And obviously sometimes the enjoyment of it <clears throat> is really just grinding shit out and feeling horrible. Um, and that's the reality of stuff, the things that, you know, sometimes you got to do stuff you don't want to do. But when I was, uh, when I sometimes take a step back, man, if I was just doing like a normal weight training workout, you know, you start with a warm up and maybe do some bench press and stuff. And then you're like, man, what do you, what do I want to do? And I'm like, man, screw it. I'm just going to do dips for as many dips as I can with a 20 pound vest. And I want to see if I can uh, get X amount of reps. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to do uh, plate raises and uh, see if I can get one set of 50. And you just kind of have some 
enjoyment. Like, what would you really want to do right now? I mean, I'm not always going to do, I'm sorry, I know this is probably heresy, but sometimes I'm just not going to do what I always, always, like I have to do. And, uh, but as long as I'm getting in the major stuff, um, for example, as long as I'm getting my ab work in, uh, when I was squatting and deadlifting, I didn't really care what I did. And we would just make up the most ridiculous exercises, me and Kevin DeWeese, and we would just have some fun. And uh, it would be uh, obnoxious, and we would push each other. And uh, But the most important thing is, especially as an older dude, man, that's your time. And that's your time to have some fun. For younger guys, that's an awesome bonding time. We always, <clears throat> when we do our assistance work, I just let the kids rip. And they, <clears throat> a lot of the older kids just start doing some, you know, they're doing a, uh, a contest to see how many dumbbell squats they can get uh, with a hundred pound dumbbell in eight minutes or something like that. And these kids just make up the challenges and have some fun. So um, yeah, just remember it's your time and enjoy the time. It's okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Kevin Dixon says, in my next cycle, I'm looking at running my first set last work as a circuit. For example, press, chins, dips times five, or deadlifts, belt squats, and glute ham raises times fives. Like it or stupid? No, it's fine. That's awesome. Uh, that's very good. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a big fan of running stuff as a circuit. Uh, as, as long as your FSL work is crisp, as long as your reps are uh, good, you know, don't turn it into a conditioning circuit so much as a lifting circuit. There's a big, big difference between those two. So don't compromise your rep speed and rep quality to hit a certain time. I, I cannot stand that. Uh, Caleb says, what's the strongest lift you have ever seen in a meet or in the gym? Uh, I don't know what the strongest lift. You know, I've seen some the strongest dudes. I've seen some, I, the most, I guess, thing that comes to mind is Rob Fuzner was one of the strongest dudes I've ever seen lift in my life in the gym. Uh, there was a time when I was training at Westside where Chuck Vogelpohl was doing uh, some squats on Friday and, uh, I don't know what weight it was. It was stupid. A million pounds of band tension and like 9,000 pounds on the bar. And uh, he missed uh, whatever weight it was. And then he put a 25 on each side, you know, punched himself in the face a couple times and then did a double. And I just, it was unbelievable. So, uh, you know, I got to see Andy Bolton's, the first thousand pound deadlift, which was incredibly impressive. Um, you know, you have to understand that in the high end, you know, the high end lifting world, which I was not, I competed in, but I was not like that. Uh, there are some guys out there who you probably never really know uh, and maybe didn't achieve a ton uh, on the platform, but just had this just insane amount of strength. I mean, just total dude strength, you know. And uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, and those are the guys you got to watch out for, especially if they have a few cocktails in them. Woo, we. Jared Bobek says, hey, good morning, Jim. I'm glad I have caught a stream finally. Well, thank you, Jared. Uh, great meeting you at Swiss. Well, that's awesome. He's rocking his Train to be Dangerous shirt. In his finals today. Well, that's awesome, man. I hope you do well in the finals. Oh, God. Bad times. Zach says, who was in your group at Westside? Do you still keep in touch <coughs> with the Westsiders you lifted with? Uh, this was so long ago. I was in the morning crew. So I had, you know, obviously Lou there. Chuck was there. Dave was there. Uh, Mike Ruggieri was there. I know I'm missing a whole bunch of people, but uh, I still keep in, obviously in touch with Dave. So, but for the most part, I don't keep in touch with anyone. I don't keep in touch with a lot of people. So it's really nothing to do with that. Uh, I just, uh, 
I'm not the best. I'm probably like many of you guys. I rarely answer texts. Text. I don't answer my phone very often. I'm just not really big into that stuff. Um, and maybe that's a bad thing or good thing, but um, no, I really don't besides Dave. So, but I had an awesome time at West side. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the mythical stuff at West side gets, at least for me is really uh, been glamorized way too much, but maybe that's just me. Um, they make it sound like it was super cutthroat and, everyone was going to kill you and all that stuff. And that, that wasn't my experience. Uh, so, but maybe, I don't know, maybe I just saw things differently and maybe my experiences in other parts of my life uh, were a little more intense as far as uh, practice and stuff like that. Ryan Elliott says, Hey Jim, after not running for three years after a full Achilles rupture, whoo. <coughs> Do you, do you have any advice for the 40 plus lifter trying to get back into sprinting? Also curious if you still run or sprint. I do not. I wrote a whole part in the five through one forever book about this. And basically it comes down. I, what I recommend is running for X amount of yards or meters per day and running and not jogging. And the way that I, really recommend and I did this years ago was doing a fartlek yes that's what it's called style of uh, running where you uh, run you don't sprint but you don't jog you run for x you know let's just say 40 yards or 50 yards or 100 yards then you walk you know for 50 yards or so and just see what your body can handle um, but I would very very cautiously maybe start with Again, I don't know where you're at, so it might be as low as 500 yards. It might be as much as, you know, 1,600, you know, <clears throat> a mile or so of total running and walking. Um, but I would really advise you to start doing uh, probably anywhere between 50 and 100 yards and running just continuous uh, sprints. I don't mean sprints, I mean runs. And just make sure you're fully recovered and you're just working on your technique and then building that over time where you can actually run or in your case, sprint. So, you know, the one of the big things is not just your Achilles when your older people have to be careful about, uh, and I've seen this happen way too many times is their hamstrings uh, because they tend to overstride and their body's just not used to it anymore. So you have to be careful with that. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of older people using Hill sprints because you can't overstride. Prowler sprints doesn't have to be heavy on the prowler, but you can go as hard as you really want, and you're not going to pull a hamstring. And then obviously you can uh, sprint up the stairs at a stadium and stuff like that. Uh, tier zero operator said, what would be the strength standards you would hang your hat on for the squat bench and deadlift and pull-ups? For a natural lifter, not interested in drugs. Uh, man, listen, I've, again, I, if you're not terribly, you know, if you're a naturally skinny dude who doesn't have a lot of genetic uh, strength, so to speak, you know, anything that you do better than what you are today is awesome. But generally, I think, like, what is, like, you know, maybe uh, – deadlift two and a half times your body weight, squat two times your body weight, and bench press, I don't know, maybe one and a half times your body weight and be able to do 20 pull-ups. I think that would be pretty good. But, you know, the, the problem with that stuff too is if you are a really good deadlifter and not a very good squatter, people get hung up in these ratios and it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, you know, if you squat 500, you should be able to deadlift 700. Well, if you're just built to squat and not built to deadlift, then there's going to be a massive discrepancy in the ratio. And uh, as an example, you know, people will say, hey, you know, my deadlift is this and my squat is this. You know, what's the issue? And I'm like, well, the issue is you're terribly concerned with the ratio and not just getting stronger. I mean, according to them, they would rather have a 500 pound uh, squat 
and a 700 pound deadlift rather than having a 700 pound squat and a 700 pound deadlift because the ratio is not perfect. So just uh, understand that, you know, if you're a really good deadlifter, for example, and you have very long arms, your bench press probably isn't going to be that good. And that's okay as long as you're trying to progress in that lift. So, but I think probably, you know, two and a half, two, and then one and a half, uh, those ratios, and then about 20 pull-ups or so. So, <clears throat> uh, DB says, good morning, Jim. My 12-year-old son has finished up his second cycle of 531. It's been great to have this program to introduce strength training to him in a better way than how I started in the 90s. Uh, <clears throat> that's awesome, man. Just remember that barbell has to be strong and powerful and have him be in control. The goal is not to have him lift X amount of weight. The goal is for him to get stronger using the appropriate weight. So don't be a weight, uh, bar weight chaser. Be a perfectionist in how you do the lifts and the quality of each and every rep. Uh, <clears throat> he says, Jim, if, uh, another question from heavyweight. If you haven't done the ruck yet, I already done it. Please make sure you take foot powder and extra socks as a source of fruit for insulin spike on the ruck. Uh, yeah, I've already done it. I stunk at it. That's all right. Uh, he says I would be a hell of a leader in the military. Yeah, maybe now, but not back in the day. Let's just uh, let's just be honest. I was I was a pain in the ass, you know, all the way up until I was about thirty eight years old. Uh, <clears throat> Harrison Honor says, "Hey, I'm walrusing right now." Good morning, gents. Well, good morning, Harrison. I hope you have a kick ass training session. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Jason says, Hey, do you think that high school athletes should wear a weight belt or knee sleeves when lifting? It may not matter much, but curious what you think. Uh, I mean, if they want to wear a weight belt or sleeves, that's fine. I, we never wear a weight belt. I've never seen a need for one, but maybe some people do. The only way like knee sleeves are fine, especially if they've had like a pre existing knee injury or something's you know, a little wonky in their knee. It definitely helps. I have no problems with that. Uh, but for the most part, unless you have some kind of weird injury or something, uh, we never, it's never even come up at London. I've never, ever, ever had a kid ask about a belt. So, uh, but <clears throat> that's just my opinion. And we're also training to get stronger for sports. We're not maxing out and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So I'm sure that comes into play. Uh, do, 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 do. Elio says, Hey, I have knee pain that gets better with rest and seems to get worse when I start squatting again, even just bodyweight squats. Any ideas for what I should try? Uh, well, I am not a doctor or a physiotherapist or whatever the hell physical therapist. The two things I would probably try is one, try on some knee sleeves, it makes a huge difference. Uh, I can do a billion uh, body weight squats or weight vest squats uh, every day and without any knee pain. If I don't wear my knee sleeves, man, I feel like a rickety old man. It makes a giant difference, at least for me it does. The other thing is uh, <clears throat> making sure your hips are incredibly mobile and not just uh, mobile as in doing a hip flexor stretch, uh, doing like hip 90-90s uh, hurdle duck unders and step overs and stuff like that, as well as um, a lot of times your IT bands get really tight and they start pulling. So rolling out your IT bands and being consistent with that, uh, that <clears throat> seems to have uh, cured a lot of knee pain, not just with me, but with others. So give it a shot. Uh, so again, knee sleeves, uh, making sure your hip mobility is really good. And your IT band, make sure you roll that out. <clears throat> uh, for a 12-year-old starting 531, what dumbbell squat would be a good regression for the barbell? I don't understand that question. Or would you still use 531 percentages for the dumbbell or seek total amount of reps at a set weight? 
Now, you just with the dumbbell, you have to use a dumbbell that's appropriate for the kid. We don't use percentages or anything like that. We let the kids choose their weight. And uh, I think my wife does – she's not here right now, but she coaches the younger kids. And I think they have to do a 60-pound dumbbell or 65-pound dumbbell for 20 reps, and that's how they earn their way to a barbell. I could be wrong. It might be – a 50 or 55 or something. So, uh, and they have to be perfect reps. They can't be all fuddy duddy and fidgeting and stuff like that. They have to be the proper depth, have to be in control, have to stand all the way up and complete each rep. You know, they're not just doing pumper reps, uh, that I cannot stand. So, uh, you know, with, when you're teaching a kid how to dumbbell squat, don't, and, you know, you're using as a way to build uh, the legs for the barbell squat. Don't be in a rush. Start with a nice light dumbbell. Make sure they're learning how to do stuff. Make sure you're not putting all this pressure on them to, to graduate to the barbell. There's plenty of time. There's, he's 12 years old. So don't get all crazy about that. And generally, we probably do about 50 total reps, depending on the kid, sometimes 30. And just depends on uh, – where we are in there. So, but yeah, you know, we'll probably do three to five sets uh, <clears throat> with the dumbbell squats, but it's been a long time since I've had to deal with those, those kids uh, gets uh, <clears throat> those kids, mostly my wife handles. And then my, I do train James, my youngest son. And uh, so when we started with the dumbbell squat, we just started with a, I don't even remember maybe a 20 pound dumbbell. I mean, he was very young. So, uh, <clears throat> but I'm also the most conservative strength coach in the world. And I will not move up any weight until I am a billion percent satisfied, not just with one set, but for a lot of different sets over a long period of time. So, um, and that's how I treat the kids at London too. I'm probably way too conservative sometimes, but uh, the one thing I do know is that <clears throat> There's no bad consequences about doing great reps. You may disagree, but that's just the way I feel. Um, some guy says, I, uh, Harrison says, I've been including some kettlebell RDLs in my walrus routine. This is a dangerous sin, right? Will my body break and my family will leave me? No, that's a fine exercise. You're more than welcome to do it. I apologize if you think that it's not, if I made you feel that way. <coughs> uh, do you think high reps and lifts like the squat and deadlift would still be effective for increasing jumping and sprinting? Or would you make it recommend one to five reps of heavy weights would be more effective? Uh, well, it depends on who you're talking about. If you have a young athlete, you know, and he doesn't have a high fitness level, then the most important thing is he just gets stronger. And part of getting stronger is doing higher reps. And remember, if you're doing sets of one to five reps, they don't have to be super heavy. They can be light and you can do multiple sets of really good weights. That's like one of the things that we do a lot of multiple sets of really good weights that aren't taken to failure. But yeah, there's this idea that, you know, you can only do high reps or low reps and ones for strength. Listen, if you don't have a high level of fitness and strength, it's always going to make you stronger. It's always going to make you better. Uh, so uh, don't get caught up in that. The most important thing is that you're doing the, the right reps. You're getting stronger. You're doing a lot of exercises uh, or a lot of rep ranges, and you're just getting better. So that's all that stuff is nonsense. Like if I – obviously, I want my our kids to get faster – so what am I supposed to do? Put a 120 pound kid who's 14 years old under a barbell and just fucking max him out. It's ridiculous. You just have to get them physically fit and you have to listen. All I'm doing is building assassins out there and I'm just, <clears throat> I want to build the strength and stability and uh, the fortitude of a human missile. That's pretty much what it is. And so I don't get caught up in all that other stuff. I think that's just fucking noise and it drives me nuts. Oh, it drives me nuts. There's amazing, like, if you saw how simple and basic our training is and uh, how strong our kids get, they not, may not be the strongest kids in the world, but they get stronger than they ever were. 
and ever could uh, think they could be. And we do so very simply uh, because I'm not pressing the issue and I'm not feeding my ego as a strength coach. I'm doing it what's best for the kids. So figure that shit out on your own, you dumbass strength coaches. God, it drives me nuts. All right. When you give your football kids the goblet squat 50 for 50, do you care if they hit parallel? Yes. Ask because I'm training my wife and she doesn't hit it and not sure how to stress over it. Uh, well, <clears throat> I would if we that's one of the deals is we want uh, we obviously want good hip mobility. And uh, unless the kid has some kind of prior injury. But yes, that's what we do. I would highly recommend elevating her heel. You can just put some plates underneath her. We do all of our dumbbell squats with a plate underneath our heels, regardless. Uh, and it makes a huge difference. So Eric Lewin says, love all the misfits talk. I love the misfits. Any other punk bands you appreciate? I really can't stand punk other than the misfits. I'm probably a few bands here and there, but, uh, they're all stinky and crusty. Uh, no, thanks. It's not heavy enough for me. It's not nasty enough for me. So, uh, <clears throat> Let's see here. I've heard you say you want the kids to have strong hip flexors. Uh, I don't do any training for the hip flexors, I guess. I mean, it's a consequence, I think, of training. Um, and then he goes on and he says that's counter to what a lot of people talk about, avoiding a lot of lumbar flexion and hip flexion because the kids get tight from sitting in school all day. Can you expand your thoughts on this? Uh, well, obviously, I mean, we do a lot of leg raises, a lot of hanging leg raises and weighted sit-ups with the, hand, the feet held down. But listen, I, that was really popular back in the eighties and nineties that, you know, when you did ab work, the most important thing would be to take the hip flexors out. And I still think you obviously have to have strong hip flexors to be a strong sprinter. And I'm not sure you need to directly train them all the time. Because, you know, if you're doing leg raises and uh, weighted sit-ups and stuff like that, and you're off, obviously running a lot and sprinting a lot, you're going to get a lot of hip flexor work in there. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, we work around, obviously, we do a lot of mobility work for our hips, too. So, I don't really have, um, get crazy about either or. Um, I think it's just a natural consequence of how you how we train that our kids' hip flexors get strong. But if I'm going to be completely honest, that's really not on my radar much because, listen, if your kids can't do some basic stuff, I'm not going to, fle I'm not going to worry about hip flexor strength uh, when a kid can't jump on a 40-inch box or can't run a mile, uh, if he can't do 15 pull-ups. Like, that's the hip flexor stuff. is It's a long way away from <clears throat> where our kids are. Uh, I don't know how people – or what people are training in their in their schools uh, if all their kids are just super advanced or something I don't get it because I don't see it but maybe I just all our kids are just not as strong as every other school I don't know uh, okay oh, well man we got we got a lot of questions here so here we go are pre-workout supplements ever useful or are they just snake oil if they help you with your workout, they're probably pretty good. Uh, just don't, if they have a lot of you know, stimulants in them, be careful. Um, and just don't get dependent on them. So, but I, I think that's what you're asking about, right? Like stimulants and pre-workouts. Just don't get, don't get, uh, <clears throat> you know, don't make it so that if you don't have it, you won't train or anything like that. Be able to, to, to build your own intensity, but there's nothing wrong with getting a little push in the right direction. Uh, do, 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 do. Jacob B says, thanks, Jim. My son is pushing to use the barbell, but I'm stressing the dumbbell until his mobility and strength increases. He's tall and skinny. So his squat form has been interesting. That's part of the deal, man. The one thing that you can do is, you know, use the, the, the dumbbell as not just a teaching tool, but a strengthening tool and then find other ways to strengthen his legs, such as uh, sleds and hills um, and uh, <clears throat> stuff like that, like outside the weight room maybe. 
and occasionally putting a barbell on his back that he can handle and not using it as a load, just using it as a uh, teaching tool. And that way he can kind of get used to using the apparatus without it being loaded down. So, but I'm a big fan of strengthening the legs outside the weight room. I think it helps quite a bit. Uh, yesterday we had a <clears throat> train. Uh, we don't, we're not training today on Friday. So we did uh, <clears throat> our our Friday workout on Thursday and we did some super heavy for us prowler pushes. And uh, I still think that's just as important as uh, squats and deadlifts is uh, doing prowlers and hills and stuff like that. So uh, any thoughts on incorporating hinging in a walrus program? Yeah, there is a entire section in the forever book about that. Uh, yeah. You can do, yeah, that's all, it's already in the program, man. I don't know what you read about it, but yeah, that's already in the program. You can do any kind of uh, kettlebell stuff, and that's part of the, uh, one of the tests in the walrus program. Uh, any tips on building some solid push-up handles? Go to your, uh, you know, local hardware store and just use PVC pipe and any kind of plumbing that you have and make them nice and thick and just start piecing them together. I don't know all those pieces, man. And, uh, <clears throat> so, but it's dude, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Just have someone kind of help you. Uh, and I think they're about an inch and a half or two inches thick. I mean, they're fairly big, uh, but just don't make them super skinny. It's going to hurt your hands. Um, Uh, I am training someone who uses the safety squat bar for the last year. He is 16 and got hemorrhoids from too much stress with long hours at school and marching band. He has devolved lower back pain. He has lower back pain. Uh, I've had to back off on squats and deadlifts. Should I only do dumbbell squats with belt squats or use only a I don't understand the question. Listen, if, if he's got all kinds of issues, man, I recommend doing the, uh, the similar program as the, uh, what Joe DeFranco did in the washed up meathead. So you'd, uh, you know, do an upper body day on Monday, do a lower body day on Wednesday, like main lift, and then an upper body on Friday and just bring in the total volume down and not going bananas on that stuff so that <clears throat> his body gets a chance to rest. That <clears throat> best advice I can give you, especially a 16 year old kid who's obviously fitness is not that good. So you don't have to just jam him full of stuff. He's not a power lifter. So super important that you understand that. Uh, and that doesn't mean you can't do some upper body day, some upper body work on Wednesday or lower body work on Mondays and Fridays, but it doesn't have to be a lot, two to three sets, and you'll be good to go. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and get this. Uh, <clears throat> I watched your interview before. <clears throat> we only got a little bit of time here, so I'm going to try and just get to the question. I watched your interview before about high school athletes. You were using three days a week. One main lift, three assistants, 50 to 100 total reps. Main lifts using five through one principles. Yes. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> long time follower here, Jim. Did Just curious, did you kick the tobacco habit? Yes. Um, and about the kid who's got the hemorrhoids and stuff, man. Listen, you got to... When you train kids, you have to be, you have to have an understanding of where they are physically and their readiness and preparedness. They're not like they used to be. That's not their fault, guys. It's just the way things are. So thinking that they can handle all the stuff that maybe you could handle years ago, um, thinking about, uh, you know, maybe what uh, you can do now, you, these kids can't do it anymore, Okay. So you have to learn the training. <clears throat> they, you have to use an appropriate training program for who they are and where they are now. 
Don't just jam them into an old school training program and then call them soft because they get hemorrhoids and they feel like shit. All right. That's one of the worst things you could do. And I see it happen all the time. Uh, you have to be cognizant of whatever your reality is at the point. And if a kid, you know, can only do one or two exercises a day, he's so overweight, then he's going to have to do one or two exercises a day and do some extra stuff on his own. Okay. Uh, as far as like walking, uh, especially if they can <clears throat> walk up and down stadium stairs and stuff like that. Um, so <clears throat> it would be just like if, uh, you know, your mom wants to get into training, you're not going to take her to West Side Barbell and be like, just jump in with the boys, man. You're going to be fine. Everything needs to be scaled and be scaled appropriately. And it's been my experience that young athletes today, even really good athletes, just can't uh, handle all the stuff that a lot of us uh, were used to doing when we were young. And again, that's not their fault, guys. That's just the reality of the situation. So make sure you adjust and adjust. If your kids are not getting bigger, if their kids are, if your kids aren't getting stronger, then look at what you're doing. <clears throat> Is it truly appropriate for who they are and what they are as athletes? Okay. So it also built some muscle. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right. Does anyone have any more questions? I'm just about to go. And uh, it's, man, it's been beautiful out here in Columbus or London, I guess, technically. And it has been, uh, you know, it's been chilly, but wonderfully chilly. I love this kind of weather. The dark, uh, the <clears throat> getting too dark too quick, but I love kind of the overcast Columbus days. I love sleeping with my window open at night and it's freezing in the morning. And uh, so, uh, okay, one last question. What brought you to London, Ohio? Well, uh, Dave Tate and Elite FTS um, brought me to London, Ohio. I, Dave uh, was the first kind of full-time employee at, at uh, Elite FTS. And so I moved up from uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and I moved to London, Ohio, and I just stayed here. Um, <clears throat> all right, a few more here. Do single leg exercises have to be single leg? Uh, Mark, I guess that's kind of their definition, right? Yes, so single leg exercises should probably be single leg exercises. Maybe I don't know what that means. Man, am I out of, am I out of touch? Are people doing two-legged lunges now? Is that what the squat is? No one knows. Anyway, hey, I appreciate everyone. We'll be back, uh, be back next Friday. Hopefully, I'm going to feel a little bit better. Uh, and uh, maybe I'm not coughing so much. One last question says, do you plan to start lifting weights again, or do you just plan to do body weight, kettlebell, et cetera work? I mean, lifting weights like basic barbell lifts. Uh, if I, my body tells me I should, or if I want to, I will. I don't really care uh, either way. It's not a big deal to me. Um, the most important thing that is, you know, I feel good and I'm doing the things I want to do. Um, and as long as I continue my journey into learning and stuff like that, listen, <coughs> I saw a lot of this stuff as a curse, and I think it's easy uh, when injuries happen. You know, when I got hit by that that uh, vehicle, it'd be easy for me to feel sorry for myself. But, you know, the best thing was it, it opened me up to different styles of training and a different mentality. And I'm, frankly, a way better coach, uh, way better coach now than I was, you know, 15 years ago. And obviously, you're going to develop over time. But had I not had to change i wouldn't i'd be still stuck in my ways and there's not that there's anything wrong with just using the barbell <clears throat> but there's different ways of uh getting stronger there's different ways of getting better and i think that's been kind of a a good thing for me so uh, evolution my friends movement is life Movienta es vida, as they said in World War Z. All right, I'm out of here, guys. I got to go walk up and down stairs like a madman until I, my legs feel like they're going to fall off. Uh, thank you guys for showing up. 
I will see you next Friday, uh, probably about the same time, unless something else happens. So anyway, have a great uh, weekend. Do something stupid conditioning-wise if you can, and uh, eat a pizza or something. <laughs>